Thanks, Gary. You're listening to Search the Scriptures Daily, a program in which we encourage everyone who desires to know God's truth to look to God's Word for all that is essential for salvation and living one's life in a way that is pleasing to Him. In this first segment of our program, today we'll be addressing some of the mystical practices that are being promoted within evangelical Christianity and that are attracting many of our young people. So what are mystical practices? Well, if you've not followed our programs for a while, they're attempts to enrich one's spirituality through various techniques and methods. Mysticism is described as the ways and means to gaining contact or communion with the ultimate reality or God, and its goal is union with God, which is, in the uh, classical sense, means merging into God. Now, Dave, we should discuss that a bit. Uh, we now hear some young people who are attracted to this mysticism, and they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just into things that will draw me closer to God. Union with God, to me, is just, uh, just communicating with him and drawing closer. But, you know, we've also heard uh, people who are into yoga and reincarnation say, well, you know, I'm not really into that kind of stuff. I'm into, like, reincarnation. They would say, you know, probably in a prior life I, I was a famous person or, or something like that. It's almost like they're uh, homogenizing these classic concepts into a way that fits into their ideas, their thoughts, their culture, really. Mm -hmm. You said these young people say, well, I'm just into things that will get me closer to God. Mm -hmm. um, what things did God say in his word would get you closer to God? Um, idols or some ritual? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, we get to know him through his word, by his spirit, but uh, it's not a... a See, th this is presuming that apparently God has some difficulty in getting in communion with us, and we're going to help him out. Uh, no, he communes with us through his word. Uh, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. And there's no truth in a candle or an icon or... Um, Incense. Anything mm -hmm. physical. Um, Tom, it's a uh, – I don't, I don't want to go on too long, but let me just make – I think we need to understand something. Yeah, they, this is important because, as I said, uh, people who think that uh, union with God has just a, a limited meaning really are missing what these people who have developed this, the, you know, the mm -hmm. ancients, mm -hmm. they're talking about pantheism or panentheism, getting into God or becoming God himself. Actually, Tom, it's a, it is a step or many steps away from God. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, I'm dealing with atheists who are materialists. There's nothing but the physical universe. Now, we also have Christians who are materialists. And I call this Christian materialism because mysticism is really tied in with material things. Right. Uh, so I, I say, if I can say, say it quickly, it began with Eve. She thought that a material thing, a piece of fruit, would give her knowledge and... Uh, would make her like God, you know, never mind drawing closer to him. Well, she would become like God. Not that she would become God, but she would become like God. And uh, that's pretty much what these people are aiming for. And you have it all through Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. this little wafer. Well, can it be a symbol? It, can it point me back to the Sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Oh, no, 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 no. It has to be his body. So now they're into materialism again. Mm -hmm. Now, we can disprove that very quickly. When Jesus said, uh, John seven thirty seven, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Well, what kind of water is he going to offer them? <laughs> Not physical water. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Is that physical water? I haven't seen a Christian yet with water gushing, gushing out of their innards. Uh, 
when he said to the woman at the well, and, and we've been over this many times, but these are the classic cases that Jesus used. When he said to the woman at the well, you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. You drink of the water that I will give you, you'll never thirst again. Was that physical water? No. So this mysticism and the emerging church and all of their accoutrements mm -hmm. uh, are taking us back to the physical water, not the water that Jesus gives, which is not physical. And why would this water that Jesus gives, why is that going to come through some physical means? It is not. This is the, the Holy Spirit indwelling us. This spake he, and jump back to John 7 again, this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. So they're actually taking us away from God. Mm -hmm. They're taking us away from spiritual life. They're taking us away from truth. They're taking us into techniques and things. Uh, and, you know, Paul says, you're going back to the weak and beggarly elements. Mm -hmm. Paul says, the tabernacle, and, and then, of course, the temple, this was a sign of the heavenlies, what's in the heavenlies. Well, no, they, they wanted to, well, for example, the, the brazen serpent, that's a picture of Christ becoming sin for us, being as as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, so the children of Israel, then they carried this serpent with them, and they began to worship this serpent. Well, wouldn't you think that that would do the job better than just remembering this? No, it does not. Mm -hmm. And Well, the Lord had them in the time of Hezekiah destroy this thing. Right. So... God said to Moses, see to it that you make it according to the pattern that was given you on the mount. Mm -hmm. Now, who gave this pattern? Who gave these icons? And who gave these labyrinths? And who, where, where did this come from? And who says that this is the means of getting in touch with God and union with God? Not the Bible. Mm -hmm. and not the Holy Spirit. No. So we are being taken away from God and away from his truth and away from the Holy Spirit and away from true worship. Dave, uh, last week, as you remember, we, we mentioned labyrinths, prayer labyrinths. We talked about prayer labyrinths, and uh, we just started to talk about the Stations of the Cross. But I, I want to go back over uh, prayer labyrinths because of its incredible popularity today. I mean, I've got some quotes here, but... First of all, for those who are not familiar with the prayer labyrinth, it's a circular or concentric pattern of uh, paths, for, and it's for meditation purposes. And what you do, you begin at the outside of this pattern, and you take a path, and you walk to walk to the center of it. And it's not like a maze where you end up in a mm – -hmm. uh, you, you don't know how to get out of there. Mm -hmm. These paths lead right to the center and then out again. And um, their origins go back to, to pagan religions. They were created around the 13th century by the Catholic Church. Uh, and they were to enable Catholics to meditate upon Christ's uh, passion walk, or what's called the Via Del Dolorosa, uh, the Walk of Sorrows, which he carried his cross from, from uh, the Praetorium to, to Calvary's Hill. But the idea for Catholics and why these things were created was that during the time, the Muslims had control of the, the holy city of Jerusalem and Israel, and uh, it was too dangerous to go on a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And the reason they would go on a pil pilgrimage was to gain an indulgence, plenary indulgence. Now, we're going to talk about indulgences. You, you mean the, Mus but, the Muslims hadn't yet heard that Islam was peace? I guess not. For more information about the Berean Call, call us toll-free at our order number or visit our website.